right, in three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this Friday evening. My name is McKaylee. I work at Tattered Cover Bookstore. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you for shopping locally. Thank you for supporting local independent bookstores. It is the reason that we are still here over the crazy 18 months that we've had as a human race um, combating one of the biggest incidents to happen to us in such a long time. And, and we thank you so much for that. Um, Tattered Cover is turning 50 this year in 2021, which is an amazing feat for a bookstore. We owe a large part of that success to you, our community, both virtual and soon to be coming back in person. Uh, before I go any farther, I wanna let you know that closed captioning is enabled for those who might want it or need it. There's a black bar at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. You click that button, closed captioning is enabled should you want it or need it. And a little bit about Tattered Cover, as there, I know there are some of you joining us from outside of our state. We are a local independent bookstore in Colorado, and we have four locations, soon to be five, like in a week. We have our brand new children's location opening up at Stanley Marketplace, which is amazing. And you should visit our brand new um, McGregor Square location. And then later in the year, we'll have Westminster. So many amazing things happening. The best way to keep up with it though, is by signing up for our email newsletter or following us on social media. You could also go onto our website and purchase books online at tattercover.com if you want. Uh, we'll ship anywhere, really. We're, we're setting up this whole system about getting books into prisons, which is really cool as well. Our web store is really making sure that reading is accessible to everyone. Um, and so you can get all your bookish needs at tattercover.com. Also on tattercover.com is our events. Oh my gosh, we have a lot. I was just telling our guests earlier that we have over 40 this month here in June, and we've got more coming up. Some of them include some in person as we start to slowly but surely transition. So keep an eye out for those as well. But the one that we have tonight, I'm very excited for. We have um, one of our favorites, uh, Nate Hake, who is joining us. He's done uh, one travel series with us and we're gonna be doing another one later this month. Um, but we're celebrating author Cheney Kwok's new book, The Passenger. Um, and it's got a subtitle, but I don't wanna give too much away in their talk here <laughs> as well. Um, but a little bit about our guest that we have. Nate Hake is a recovering attorney and digital nomad from Denver, Colorado. And he's the founder of Travel Lemming. In 2016, Nate started out on a year long trip around the globe, which took him to 43 countries across six continents. And he hasn't really stopped since. Nate loves exploring emerging destinations and vibrant cities. His goal is to help end over tourism by promoting travel to places that may not be on your tourist list, but still have plenty of space for new visitors. And our author tonight, Chaney Kwok, has been traversing the globe for more than a decade to write about food and travel. His work appears regularly in newspapers such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, as well as magazines such as Condé Nast Traveler and Food and Wine and Travel and Leisure. Kwok teaches nonfiction at the Stanford Continuing Studies Program and lives in San Francisco. And again, we're talking about his new book, The Passenger. So now I'm gonna turn uh, the cameras over so we can see both of our guests tonight. Hello, gentlemen, welcome. Hello. Hi, Michaeli. Hi, oh, it's good to see you again, Nate, and it's so nice to meet you, Chaney. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Well, I'm so excited for this conversation from two well-seasoned travelers here and, and two who have experience in writing about travel as well um, and talking about your new book, Cheney, The Passenger. I want to remind our audience, though, that we are going to be doing a Q&A session. So there's a chat next to the screen you're watching us on right now, and you can uh, ask all your questions from there. I'm going to turn off my camera and let you gentlemen take it away. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, I... Uh... For those who haven't read the book, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask Cheney a few questions here, and then if uh, you have any questions that you still have, put them in the chat, and we'll get them to them at the end. Um, I, Cheney, this was just an incredible read. I mean, a really quick and easy read. I think what, I, I can't decide what I loved more, whether it was sort of the, uh, the gripping story um, or uh, your witty uh, and, and, and funny sort of uh, more than a little bit in places sarcastic uh, take on uh, on the travel industry. Well, thank you so much, Nate. Thank you for reading it. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that it was a fun read. Um, I wanted to write a book that was fun to read, but also made people think. So there are a lot of things going on there because on the surface, it is about a book. Uh, it is about a cruise gone really wrong. I happened to be on assignment on a cruise ship that lost power in the middle of a storm and started um, almost running aground. 
But underneath that, I think there is a lot more happening, or I'd like to hope that there's a lot more happening there, uh, which is why such a short book has a uh, subtitle um, that goes, How a Travel Writer Learned to Love Cruises and Other Lies from a Sinking Ship. Um, and that sinking ship is actually not the cruise ship. There are different kinds of sinking ships in the, in the story. Uh, so I'm so glad to hear that you enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... You know, I'm curious to hear your perspective on on for those in the audience. You know, um, we 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 come from very different sort of ends of the travel writing uh, world, uh, and so you were doing a lot at least uh, as of March 2019 uh, when the Viking Sky incident happened. You were doing a lot of of writing for as a I guess as a freelancer for for large publications. How is that being on assignment for you know a magazine? Um, how is how, how, how is experiencing a place, how is traveling different for you versus when you're just on vacation and kind of doing it yourself? Yeah, actually, when I go on vacations, I really have to turn that side of my brain off that wants to take lots of notes, uh, analyze and, and constantly think about things. One of the greatest things about being a travel writer for me anyway, as an introvert, is that it's kind of a kind of a drag for me, if you will, because that kind of emboldens me to talk to people in ways that I never do otherwise. Um, when I travel just for my own enjoyment, I tend to really kind of withdraw. Whereas when I'm on assignment, I really want to get that sound bite and and that makes propels me to talk to all kinds of strangers. Uh, so in some ways, it actually enriches the experience. Um, on the other hand, like you're right, uh, when you're writing for a large publication, you also have to think about the audience in ways that may not necessarily reflect your own point of view or um, or make you do things that you may not necessarily want to do in your own free time. Um, but in this case, actually, you know, in The Passenger, I compare myself to Margaret Mead going to Papua New Guinea, doing anthropological work, and then I correct myself. I say, this is kind of disingenuous for me to claim that kind of anthropology um, or anthropologist detached point of view, because by being there, I am actually uh, one of the many passengers there. And I certainly did enjoy many aspects of being pampered in ways that I'm never pampered at home. Um, so if, <laughs> I guess this is a very long answer to your question, which is that I, uh, I'd like to think that being a travel writer for a large publication uh, I can be a natural doing that, but right. there are certain, there's certain artifice, if you will. And so obviously in, in the case of the Viking sky, you couldn't have possibly known what was going to happen. But when you go into it, you sort of, you come in with an angle, they're saying we're, we're focusing on this and you kind of already have an outline for the story that you're then trying to create, or is it the other way around where you're yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, we would be given a complete total free reign and just immerse ourselves and come up with what we can and there are certain cases like that and you know as a freelancer you're also kind of a creative mercenary so you when you go to a place your brain's constantly cranking trying to think of other story angles that you can pitch from the same trip um, but oftentimes you do know what you absolutely have to get and for this particular assignment it was a northern lights i was really nervous about not seeing aurora borealis because if I didn't, then there was no story. And if I didn't have a story, I couldn't get paid by the magazine that sent me there. So there's that anxiety as well when you know what you're supposed to write about and you have to balance between the elements of surprise versus wanting to get exactly what you came to get. Um, so it takes some fun out of it too sometimes. Right, right. And so, um, so it, at the let's sort of set the stage for the audience for anyone who hasn't read the book. So you're com you start on the Viking uh, sky cruise and you've just come from one in Bali. Um, and so you're just kind of uh, uh, bouncing around and comparing cruises around the world. How, how, how did this cruise, you know, the specific ship, it seemed like a smaller ship. I've been on several cruises myself and the way you described it, it definitely seemed a bit different than the bigger sort of barges we had. How, how was that? 
Definitely. You know, it's not a party ship. There were no roller coasters or water slides or anything like that. And because Viking advertises so heavily on PBS and NPR, um, it attracts a different kind of um, demographic than other perhaps larger, more uh, party oriented cruise lines. But uh, <sighs> That's, I think that's where I started thinking about myself as like, oh, am I an anthropologist trying to compare and contrast? But at the end of the day, I was just trying to escape. And I, I think a lot of people can identify with that because when we go on the holidays, I think oftentimes we're trying to escape the mundane. And certainly I was trying to um, escape my personal life in that way. Um, and so is that, I mean, when we talk about travels and escape, I mean, that comes up a lot. Like, do you... I mean, how, how many of your readers, when you're writing an article, do you think are, obviously the brand wants you to sell whatever the product is, but how much of it is just people sort of traveling to get away by reading at home? I often tell people that, you know, I, I find a lot of people and I enjoy just like reading content about places, even if I'm not going. Yeah, um, I don't know, to be honest, because I, you know, especially as someone who writes more for print than, you know, uh, digital or even social media where the reactions are so immediate, I just don't know. Uh, you know, there's definitely service-oriented travel journalism, which is about helping people actually get there and know what to do, how to get there, what to eat, and all that. Um, and then there's also narrative, more personal travel stories. And I suppose they're more uh, armchair travel-ish, but even so, I think people can be inspired to hit the road after reading those. Um, I, I do think that a lot of armchair travel actually happens more on social media than ever. So that when people are trying to escape through other people's experience, then they'll more likely turn to Instagram, for instance, than uh, reading a long article. But I could be wrong. But you as a travel blogger, how, how has that been actually your experience? Do you find that most of your readers are armchair travelers or people who are actually trying to replicate or your experience or hit the road? Yeah, so I mean, that's an interesting transition to our next subject. I want to talk about like social media and kind of how, wh where everything's going in terms of travel writing. So, uh, you know, when I started writing on the blog four years ago, um, I did what I thought, what I saw everybody else doing, which is, is posting a lot on Instagram, really focusing on growing a big following, you know, doing all this. And these days, I almost never post on Instagram. If you go to my Instagram, you will find I've posted maybe three times in the last year. Um, and the reason is, is that, it's, it's, you know, it's, I think social media is, is a giant, uh, it's like a giant crowd of people trying to get your attention, a hundred different mm -hmm. people. Instead, what I do is I write guides that people find through search engines. So mm -hmm. they're, the people who come to my site absolutely are looking for whatever the thing is, because mm -hmm. they're looking for a guide to the city. They're looking for a list of things to do. They're looking for uh, day trips. I find that to be more rewarding for me because I know that these are people who need uh, something. They're going to, you know, I, popular article I have, for example, in, you know, Valladolid, Mexico, and they're heading there and they're looking for what to do and what restaurants to go to. And I know that, you know, I, I take that responsibility seriously, at least to like, people could have a, you know, it's not the end of the world. People have a bad vacation because they stay in a bad hotel because you gave a bad recommendation, but um, particularly when you're doing it at scale, you're really affecting a lot of people. And so I've grown to hate social media as well. So um, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth there. Um, <laughs> I, I'd love to kind of hear your take on, 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 on social media, what it means. There's this gripping scene in the book where, or I guess illustrative, where you're waiting, you're, you're on the boat, y'all are, you know, in, in, your, uh, in your life jackets, huddled together. And you, despite not having any power on the boat, you still somehow have service on your phone. And, um, and you said that you could like watch it unfold in real time on Twitter as you're living out this sort of uh, big disaster. Like I, that was to me was sort of a very interesting and reflective tidbit on, um, on, on, on sort of the state of things today. Yeah. But you, the, the book you have a, a lot of, I think very interesting and poignant and at times conflicted thoughts on, you know, on social media and all this. So I, how do you sort of view social media and what it has done to travel and to travel writing? You're absolutely right. I think my attitude towards social media is certainly conflicted, uh, mostly fear, but also <laughs> conflicted. Um, it does connect people, no doubt about it. But I also think that it can be 
I think most of us can agree that it can be very toxic as well. Uh, for travel, I think it's created a scene where uh, we're looking for that perfect shot to brag to the whole world about, right? Um, and you brought up a really interesting point earlier, which is also kind of refreshing, which is that as a travel blogger, you don't actually seek a following, right? That's not what I often hear from travel bloggers. You're actually more interested in helping people who are looking for that specific destination, right? Um, I suppose in some ways that's what travel writers can do as well, because when I, for instance, wrote a guidebook, I knew exactly that people were, you know, trying to figure out what to do in San Francisco, where I live. Um, but social, as far as social media is concerned, it's interesting because I've thought about this earlier today about how before Instagram, before Facebook, you know, I went to the Louvre and saw people crowded around Mona Lisa taking pictures. And I thought, geez, like, why are they doing that? Because you all know what Mona Lisa looks like and you can easily look that up. Now it's even worse, right? People are just crowded around like the must sees in order to post on their personal feeds. Um, but does that necessarily mean, is that the doing of social media? I'm not so sure because having seen people do exactly that before social media, I wonder if it's actually just a reflection of human nature, which is also kind of scary. So during the ordeal on the cruise ship that I write about in The Passenger, one of the scariest things really was seeing how social media was unfolding and disseminating misinformation as well as information, which is also insidious because then you don't know when to tune out, right? Uh, and how quickly those things were spreading. That was pretty chilling to me. But whether Mark Zuckerberg is necessarily responsible for that or whether that's just human nature, I'm not so sure. It's just emboldened yeah. by or enabled by technology. We're certainly living in a very interesting um, era. I think we can all agree. Uh, and we're changing faster than ever, so, which is why traveling again now will be interesting after COVID. Um, yeah, I definitely, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Like, how do you, how, how is travel going to be after, after COVID? Well, I know what I hope travel will be, yeah. but I don't necessarily know what travel will be. What I hope is that after having seen what it's like to move at a slower pace, I hope people will travel slower and places like Hawaii that saw what over tourism has done to the islands and then has experienced a year without tourism, I hope we can see, find a good balance between um, opening up to tourists and travelers, but at the same time, not uh, perhaps at the burden of uh, the local economy and the environment. That's what I hope. Whether that's going to be the case, I don't know. I'm a bit of a, my editor, Josh at Godin, likes to say that I'm, I'm a pessimist. <laughs> not so sure, but I really hope that's not, uh, I really hope that the future of travel changes, but we'll find out. But you're yeah. heading to Mexico very soon. We talked yeah, about I'm, it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'll be heading to Mexico in a week. Um, it was my first time. I mean, I spent most of the pandemic in Argentina, but my first time truly traveling um, since uh, all this went down. And, uh, I, I hope you're right. I mean, I think of what happened in Venice, right? Where mm. the pandemic happened and suddenly all the canals are clear. There's no mm. cruise ships in the ports of Venice. And the community did say that. They said, okay, maybe we don't, we want to limit, we want to make the cruise ships go to a port farther away, kind of limit some of this, have more controls. And just last week, that whole thing fell apart and they're reneging on it and the cruise ships are going to go back. And yeah. so it definitely is, you know, I mean, I think it'll, we'll we'll see how it happens on the other hand it's not the global pandemic is far from over as i'm constantly reminding readers and it's going to be over in different places at different times and i don't know if that's going to push everybody to go to the same places because they're the only ones open mm. um i certainly hope hope not um but yeah i think i i do find that as well i think traveling slower is um you know you get to take stuff in but the problem with social media from my perspective is it's just fear of missing out. It's everybody, it's this, it's this, if you were to write a marketing copy uh, to try to sell something, there's very few trigger points that you can do to agitate someone like creating fear of missing out. And that, especially for like the millennial and Gen X generations, it's just everything. And so you see your friends off doing all these photos all over the world. 
and you want to go, but you can't be in two places at one time. And people don't realize right. there's an opportunity to cost to everything. And going to Bali means not going to <laughs> Peru or Mexico or wherever. Um, mm -hmm. And the post-COVID FOMO is real, I think, after having kind of been on the even playing field of nobody actually going anywhere, nobody doing anything really exciting, there's that kind of FOMO is going to be really heightened. But I can assure you that the experience I describe in my book is not exactly the kind of FOMO inducing uh, thing. I don't know, actually, I could be wrong. Maybe some people really want to be on a cruise ship without a working engine in the middle of a storm with 50 oh, for feet sure. swells, 60 feet swells. But not for most people, including myself. <laughs> yeah, I think just for the attention seeking. I mean, you mentioned the, at some point you mentioned a blogger <laughs> who took advantage of this to try to promote some of their articles on whatever destination the ship happened to be near in Norway at that point. That was kind of crazy when this blogger said, thoughts and prayers for the people on this ship that may or may not sink. But hey, here are some pictures of me on a very similar ship. Check out my blog. And I remember looking at it on the ship thinking, is this guy for real? What? Right. Like, where will he stop? And also, how many likes is he getting for every person who's who dies? You know, kind of a macabre thought. Yeah, uh, he spoiler really did alert. get a lot of likes and nothing came <laughs> of it. Um, well, yeah, spoiler alert, nobody dies off the ship, which is why I'm sitting here laughing about it. But I don't think that's what makes the passenger suspenseful. I'd like to hope that it's suspenseful. Um, it comes from other things, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you know, and so I want to talk a bit about travel privilege, because I think one of the real strengths of the passenger is, um, you know, I, you come across as a very self-aware um, and at times self-critical um, traveler. I mean, it's in the subtitle. And um, you're on this ship with all of these luxury travelers. And it, at times, um, your description of them is less than charitable, um, shall we say. Um, and there's this one scene in particular that really stuck with me where a woman is being uh, taken away. One of the first ones to be taken away on a stretcher to be sort of airlifted out. And um, she's taking a selfie, you know. <laughs> right. um, but I wonder if my descriptions are necessarily entirely, you're right, it's less than charitable, but I think there's also a lot of very generous and charitable descriptions of luxury tourists and travelers. Yeah. Um, I think if it stands out as jarring, perhaps it's, it's because we're so not used to travel writers saying anything less than positive, especially about luxury travelers. And I was actually kind of tickled to see for instance, one reviewer taking issues with the fact that I seem to have this kind of animosity toward the very audience I write for, the luxury travelers. Um, and I don't actually. Uh, what I think is interesting is that just by pointing out anything less than perfect, I'm being told that I have animosity. And I think that kind of fragility that comes with privilege, that really fascinates me, actually. Um, because you would think that people in such privileged positions may actually think that they're above criticism, but actually it's, it's the opposite. So um, yeah, travel privilege, let's talk about it because the very fact that, and you know, perhaps it's my perspective as someone who's always sort of felt like an outsider to be able to see that, but I'm surprised that there's not more literature written about cruises um, that deal with that kind of discrepancy of literal upstairs and downstairs dynamics, right? You really have this like social strata that reflects uh, the world um, economic hierarchy from the top deck down to underneath, you know, below sea level with people who are never ever seen, right? Um, and, just and those by, workers are like from, you know, in almost every cruise I've been on, they're from the Philippines, they're from Indonesia, they're that's from- right countries where the prevailing wage standards are much lower. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I think on most cruise ships, the crew is like 50% of the passengers. Like it's a huge number of people. That's right. And um, many of them are never seen. In fact, you know, there are crew members who are specifically designated to be seen who are trained in customer service. But there's so many people that most passengers will never ever see. So one of the most interesting experiences I had on that ship during the incident that I described in the passenger is when I, so against the wishes of the crew members, or not crew members, but uh, I was escorted back to my room, even though the protocol was to send helpers to go up to fetch stuff. I 
was allowed to go back. And I was just really struck by seeing the hallways full of all these workers that I had never seen before, who are not in uniforms, who usually work in engine rooms and, and you know, laundries and whatnot, who were suddenly brought up because they had to be kept safe, but still out of sight from the passengers who were being evacuated. Um, that was a really, I don't want to say uh, jarring, well, no, it was a jarring experience, to be honest. I think it right. jolted me out of my own bubble as well, even though I've been hyper aware of that kind of uh, upstairs, downstairs dynamics. Um, so, you know, you know if, you, if you don't talk about it, that's a choice. If you don't even notice it, that's a choice. And if you refute that it exists, that's a choice. So my choice to write about those things in my book, The Passenger, is just as much a choice as it is for people who go on cruises and not once think about the fact, oh, there are all these people who work here and they all seem to come from all these different companies, uh, countries, um, and not pause and think about that. And furthermore, think about the kind of privilege that comes with mobility privilege that comes with the correctly colored passports, right? Where cruise passengers are allowed to just literally float past all these national borders we've erected, but most people can't have that kind of freedom of movement. So, yeah. and I like mean, the first thing that you shoved down your pants when you were leaving, the one item you took out of the room at the beginning of the book is your passport. <laughs> it's um, a double side, yeah, right? Double edged yeah. sword, right? One, I mean, the macabre thought was like, oh, I want my body to be right. identified. Um, <laughs> but sure, if uh, when it came down to that, I'm sure they, that could have also gotten me out of situations and let me right. travel back. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I was, I think it's a, a very refreshing take on um, travel writing because you're right. Travel writing is effusively positive. And if it's not, it doesn't work. You know, I've tried that. I've tried sort of more balanced takes on articles and it just doesn't work. And, and as someone so, who's not effusively positive, sometimes yeah. it's a bit of an inner conflict. <laughs> but the, I mean, but a book is the perfect format um, for this. And, and um, yeah. because you really get time to sort of peel away the layers of um, of your analysis there. You know, one thing I always tell folks though, is it's like just talking about having privilege when it comes to travel or anything doesn't necessarily, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily a negative reflection on, on the person themselves. It's more important that you acknowledge where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And particularly when it comes to travel privilege, like I, all leisure travel is luxury travel in the grand scheme of things. Even the cheapest backpacker going on the cheapest <laughs> shoestring budget still has more travel privilege than 99.5% of the people that ever be born on the face of this planet. Absolutely. Um, and I, I have to also add to the fact that traveling on the cheap is very expensive in that there's a lot of initial investment oftentimes made by our parents. I, as someone who traveled around the world in the 20s right. backpacking, I'm also hyper aware of the fact that I could do it only because my parents worked hard to make sure that I got the kind of education that I got, right? And that I didn't have to worry about car payments back home, so I could just take off and do whatever, right? And that, that in itself is um, a kind of privilege that's in, um, given to only very few people, even in developed countries, you know, like even in the US, you have to think about like how many people are actually like start paying for their cars when, you know, paying when they're 17, 18, you know, they can't just take off and go backpack around. Yeah. So, you know, on the other hand, it's, I mean, it's one of the great things about living in, in at least before the pandemic, I call that the golden age of travel. I don't know if we'll get back to it, but you know, if you, if you have, uh, if you if you come from the U.S., if you have reasonable means, if you like to travel, you know, I, I like to think it would be really hard to say, OK, I want to be uh, I want to be better at doing slam dunks than Michael Jordan or I want to be better <laughs> at painting than Rembrandt. But you could see more of the world than Marco Polo. Like that is a very attainable goal. And probably you and I both have. Um, and, you know, and that's only possible because we happen to be born in this age where there's sort of this access to the sure. world. Sure, and yeah, travel is more democratic than ever. And I think that's a great thing. And I'm not just poo-pooing on travel just because it's, uh, it's given to only a select few people, right? It's one of the greatest educations that I've ever received. Um, the question is then, you know, do you acknowledge that kind of access or do you refute that and say, no, everybody's equal to move around, you know, because that's not the case. 
So how, in sort of wrap up the travel privilege part of it, how do you, if, if I'm a traveler and I'm trying to figure out how to sort of navigate, particularly this post COVID world, where we're gonna start talk, dealing with vaccine privilege, which yeah. we haven't even touched on, you know, how do you balance that? How, how can you mm -hmm. travel responsibly and ethically without it becoming such a, you know, such yeah. a project? That, that On a smaller scale, don't squabble over 10 baht when you're in Thailand and, you know, you're drinking your beer at the hostel, but at the same time, I feel aghast at the idea of, you know, paying a little more because you're a foreigner. Um, you know, and also make sure that your uh, traveler footprint is as small as you can make it, be it environmentally, also uh, economically as well. Make sure that you're uh, spending your, your resources wisely in a way that give back, in a way that gives back to the local economy to the most micro level, rather than just relying on the same old, you know, expat owned business. Well, not just expat, but, you know, like multi, national company uh multinational owned com companies and and whatnot there are certain ways that you can make sure that your dollars are spent wisely well, you know other levels too i think you can uh participate in efforts at home to uh enact policies and lobby for change so that move movement uh, freedom of movement is more democratically um, distributed because you know the history of mankind really is about migration humans have been migrating all throughout our evolution and for us to just kind of build a wall and say like no nope, we get to cross this way but you don't i think that's uh <laughs> that's a pretty heinous crime especially if you're the kind of person who uh, think of yourself as worldly and you want to travel the world, yet you feel kind of you have problems with the fact that other people want to come to your country. country. Um, those are just a couple of things that come to my mind, but I'm sure there are more. What, what about you, Nate? Oh, you know, the one tip I have for folks, I, I don't I don't have a solution to all the ethical and moral problems in the world. And very often it can feel like when you sort of try to be ethical that you take on so much responsibility, you just give up under the weight of it. The important thing is to be aware, to acknowledge it and to try. But one of the easiest ways to be, to support local communities when you're traveling and, and save money and have a better experience, I always say is if you're in a tourist area and you're looking for a restaurant or you're looking for a thing to do or an attraction or something, just walk 20 minutes away mm -hmm. to a different part of the town. Yeah. Find a part where there's not a lot of tourists. You're going to have local restaurants that are going to be cheaper, that are maybe going to be more interesting and more random. And uh, and you'll be supporting, you know, more likely to support a locally owned business than just being in the in the whatever that core is, where nowadays a lot of it is owned by multinational corporations. You know, hotels, you know, staying in, finding a place that is locally owned. That's that's sure. easy. You'd be surprised how many hotels and are very, branded as a boutique hotel that looks like it's an independent, but it's really part of some giant conglomerate. So yeah. That's yeah, a really that's good point. I remember being in Myanmar and thinking, why is that restaurant so crowded and popular with all these foreign tourists? And this one's not. They're right across the street from each other. And then I realized that one of them was in Lonely Planet. And I thought, people, like, just because that one's in Lonely Planet doesn't make it better. Why don't you cross the street and give some love to this other bus family business, you know? Yeah, it might have been good three years ago when the writer was there. And now that, you know, the chef has moved. But um, <laughs> very cool. Um, well, one last question before I think Michaeli has some Q&A for us, but, um, you know, I think one of the more sort of riveting parts of the book um, that uh, you, you speak a bit sort of about your own personal family history and about your own uh, relationship and sort of how that colors your view of travel and without giving away sort of the whole book, I'm wondering if you could just sort of give us a bit of insight about, you know, what, how that, how your perspective was sort of shaped by that personal uh, yeah. background. Absolutely. The sinking ship in my title doesn't refer to the cruise ship. It refers to the place I happen to be in. I was not in a good place going on that assignment. Um, and of course, I think that colored a lot of what I saw. Um, so that a lot of the life examination that I ended up doing during the incident had to do with the fact that I was ready for change. And I hope that's the message that the passenger carries that um, when you feel like you're locked down in quarantine, for instance, or when you're stuck in a place and you're just going off um, 
off the course and drifting helplessly, maybe it's time to stop waiting for a lifeline to drop from the sky and start doing some really hard thinking to change where you're going. And maybe that involves some really painful decisions to jump ship. Um, and luckily, I didn't have to do that literally into the North Atlantic. But in many ways, I, I did jump ship in order to change my life. And um, in order to talk about that, I had to get very personal. Um, so I hope that uh, it was worth it and that some people out there can uh, identify with that. So it's it really does come through. It's very well. Uh, Thank you. Very powerful. Yeah. I second that. Um, and I know that a lot of other people who may have read the book uh, do too, or who will read the book, they will join us in that sentiment as well. Um, thank you both for this conversation. It was so, I love hearing people talk about things that they're knowledgeable about and things that they're passionate about and hearing the two of you volley back and forth with your different perspectives, even though it is on a very similar subject, the same subject, you know, your, your ideas that you bring to the table were wonderful. So thank you both for that. Um, we're going to keep the conversation going, but include you viewers here. We've got questions from our audience. Um, and I love this one. And I think it actually can apply to both of you. When did you get bit by the travel bug and what made you want to pursue travel or make travel a part of your career? Nate, do you want to take that one first? Oh, well, you know, I was, I grew up a military brat. Mm -hmm. So my stepfather was in the U.S. Air Force. And that meant that I spent three years living on Misawa Air Force Base in Japan. And as that was as an 11 year old, a very, um, uh, a very different perspective on life than I even had contemplated was possible, sort of, you know, and I think it really, it made me see how big the world was. And from that point forward, all I want to do is travel. And I didn't have money for another 10 years to be able to do it. But as soon as I did, um, that's kind of when I, you know, when I got out there. I wonder if it's something that's in my family history, actually, as for me, because, um, you know, when I, I did write about in the passenger about my family's history of immigration, especially my grandfather having immigrated to Japan from Korea and then back to Korea and, you know, uh, my family being in the U.S. And I think immigrants in some ways are very much people who have that trouble bug, travel bug. Um, if not just gamblers who, who gamble it all and, and try it uh, in a different place. So I wonder if it's in, in the blood, but my dad also traveled quite a bit for, for work. So uh, maybe I, he's my role model. <laughs> no, it's wonderful to hear. It's something that I too, I'm a military brat and like, you know, having parents that love travel and having grandparents that love travel, it's been something that has been passed on and yet I'm in love with a man who's never been out of the country. So, so help me goodness. I will be getting him <laughs> out of there as soon as I can. Um, I like this question too here, Cheney. What was it like going from short form like articles to something more personal and long form like a book? You know, I wasn't convinced that the passenger was a book. I thought it was a long article. The pandemic really changed everything for me because uh, the book on the surface, crew's gone wrong. Okay, WTF, done. Um, but being locked down and also having gone through that kind of major life shift cast the entire incident in a very different light. And that allowed me to embolden me really to reach out to rescue workers like helicopter, uh, I, I, the helicopter rescuer and, and whatnot in order to interview um, to learn about what they experienced. And that made the whole story more holistic. But, you know, I think it's something that every, every one of us can relate to now after having lived through COVID-19, what it's like to be locked down and in, in confined, you know, be it on a cruise ship or in your apartment and trying to make, uh, make some meaningful changes. Thank you for that. Um, Here's another one. We're thinking a lot about where we'll be going next geographically with the pandemic and on the tail end, but where do you hope to go emotionally with this ship in your past and after the pandemic? Wow, that's a really hard, but great question. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, the book, I'd like to think, ends on a very optimistic note. 
uh, life is not all black and white, of course. So there are past demons that continue to haunt me, but I'd like to hope that having um, experienced this near capsizing experience metaphorically and, you know, literally, I'd like to think that I feel more encouraged to try new waters. Um, in some ways, I've been very fortunate to call last year kind of a refuge of sorts. I was able to recharge. Um, not everybody can say that. And I feel very blessed to, to be able to say that. Um, so new waters, that's final answer. I like that a lot though, uh, which leads me to another really great question that's here. Why, why did you title the book, The Passenger and give it the subtitle that you did? Were there any other titles you considered? And oh, why there. I say that is because New Waters is something you say. And I was like, that would have been an interesting one too. But I'm yeah. curious, I like that question. Yeah, I love that question too. And for SEO purposes, they can probably help me out with this. The passenger may not have been the most, uh, the wisest choice because there's a lot of competition, competition out there. Um, you know, one of the alternate subtitles was everything is fine, mom, comma, and other lies from a sinking ship, um, in part because I talk about my mother, but also because some of the book is about trying to keep up this facade of someone, an, an adult who's good at adulting, who has it together, who really doesn't. Um, but as far as the passenger is concerned, I, I have to give credit to my editor, Josh. He really wanted to put the narrator, happens to be me, forward as a personality of the book. Um, New Waters could have been interesting too, but I think the emphasis might have shifted. And ultimately, even though it's a public spectacle that social media covered extensively. If you want to have some good laughs, just type in the name of the ship on, and you'll see some hilarious footage of things flipping and sliding around. Um, but New Water sort of put emphasis on maybe other aspects than the passenger, which emphasizes the fact that it's a deeply personal story. Um, in some ways, I'm standing kind of naked in front of the whole world. That's scary. But uh, I think the title reflects that. Maybe I should have called it The Naked Passenger. Mm. <laughs> well, I would say I don't think you're alone in that feeling. Um, you know, not all of us have experienced what you have um, in, in that way. But, you know, it's very relatable, this story of that facade, the standing by yourself, sometimes facing change and those um, twists you're given in your life. Another great question actually came up with came popped up after what you just said um, about social media. How did you feel about the social media mockery of the incident that was obviously so traumatic and impactful in your life? Have you reconciled with that at all? I was on the ship thinking too soon, like too soon, what's going on? Um, you know, good thing that it turned out the way it did, right? Had there been casualties, I don't know if I would have written a book about it, let alone a funny book, because I'd like to think the passenger is kind of funny. And, you know, it would have been literally too soon. The problem with social media is that everything is too soon, right? Because it becomes worthless unless it's on like right at that moment. And there's something really callous about it in general, not just about the coverage of the, the incident, but the way we treat so other humans on social media can be, you know, quite, uh, <laughs> quite mean. And what does that say about us? I don't know. We're all guilty though, because we're, whether we're posting or watching, we're, or participants, many of us are, so. And full disclosure, in order to promote the book, I went back on Instagram and Facebook <laughs> and just did all those things that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm just as guilty and my hands are just as dirty, but here we are. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, I think it was an interesting question because you know you think about it in the moment versus being able to look back on it. And especially you who, as Nate mentioned earlier, take this sarcastic, witty, satirical tone with it in a way, you know, it, it's something that it's just very interesting to look at the then versus the now uh, and sure. your of it. I guess the, ultimately the question is, am I any better because I took two years to make fun of things as opposed to at the moment? And my answer is no. I mean, <laughs> I don't really think this, you know, I'm superior somehow. <laughs> so no. I'm just slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do want to ask this final question. 
um, which actually is for both of you. For Nate, you as a reader of this book and for Cheney, you as a writer of this book. But what did the passenger teach you? And I'd love it if we could start with Nate's question, Nate's answer first, excuse me, and we'll end with our author of the hour. I, so what I think is, re I think it's very compelling, particularly for the moment that we're in. Um, because we talked about the title of the book earlier, sort of being centered around the passenger. Um, and I think a lot of what you take away from this is how, um, what I took away from it anyway, is how, um, how trauma can, uh, you know, traumatic incidences can um, cause us to re rethink, reassess, and sort of um, ultimately rework and replace ourselves uh, in our lives. And um, we're all experiencing that to some extent or another after the last year. And so you don't have to look very far to sort of draw a metaphor to our experience, the collective experience over the past, you know, 15, 16 months um, and the experience of uh, that comes across in the book uh, that Cheney tells us about from uh, on the book. Thank you, Nate. I mean, that's exactly what I hoped readers would take away from the book. So it's great to hear that. And that's very generous of you. Um, I'm not just saying this because my ex therapist, Dr. Singh is tuning in today, I happen to know, but uh, mental health struggles are real. And if there's one thing that I learned from writing The Passenger is that um, recounting the most painful parts of your life can be very healing at the same time. There are certain casualties as well, but when it's all said and done, and I think I, I even say this in The Passenger too, I really hope that the stories, I had hoped that the stories that I was telling could heal me someday. And my hope is that um, they can also heal other people as well in some ways. Well, I think you're on track to do that um, and at least helping in some way there. And, and this has been, like I said, such a wonderful talk. It's such an honest book and yet funny and it's very human and, and about such a crazy incident. and. I wanna thank you both for this talk, for elevating it, for bringing attention to this book. Um, it's been so wonderful to watch you both. Um, and Chaney, so thank much. you so much for this book. I wanna give each of you a chance to remind people who you are, where they can find you online and anything else you wanna say before we close out tonight. And Nate, once again, I'm gonna ask you to start and we'll, aim, we'll end with Chaney Kwok, author of The Passenger. I'm Nate, uh, you can find me at travellemming.com uh, and um, yeah, you can follow me there. Cheney. And Cheney Kwok, uh, C-H-A-N-E-Y-K-W-A-K.com, which I studied for the book. And just a final reminder, independent bookstores are awesome. They're the foundation of any civilized society and please support them. Tattered Covers, thank you so much for having us here. And everybody who came tonight, please buy a book from Tattered Cover. It doesn't have to be The Passenger. I would like that. Buy book. The Passenger. Yes, get that one. <laughs> <laughs> or other books, please. They ship everywhere. Yes, we do. And you can come in today. We have copies in the store. I know it for sure because I helped put them on the shelf um, for this event. So thank you all for coming. You can get copies of The Passenger by Ch Chaney Kwok at tattercover.com or any one of our locations. Um, and you can visit Nate's website at travellemming.com and read what he's up to there as well. We also have a future event coming up with Nate later this month that you can keep look out for our website for registration for. Um, we're still figuring out what the topic is, but it always is based on travel. And so if you have any interest in that at all, you need to watch it and you can watch our past one on our YouTube channel. You can also watch our past author events on our YouTube channel as well. Any other travel adventure ones, trust me, it's Colorado. We have plenty of travel and adventure ones that people enjoy. So check those out as well. I'm McKaylee with Tattered Cover Bookstore. And gentlemen, if you'll hang out while I close this out here, thank you all again for joining us this evening. We thank you so much for your support. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, everybody, and happy reading. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye. And we're out.